there a difference if it is acutely demyelinated as opposed to chronically demyelinated? Is it easier to remyelinate something that has just been recently demyelinated? The answer is yes. Um, and it's one of the reasons to do acutely demyelinated individuals first, because it's absolutely possible to remyelinate a chronically demyelinated lesion, but it's harder. And so the first thing you do is acute while we're still figuring out the details. Basically, what you have to do in the chronically demyelinated state is reawaken the environment to be receptive to the new cells. We don't quite know how to do that yet, but that will come. When you, I'm going, you get called on by getting the mic. That's how we're going to do this. Then they don't have to keep repeating the question. Um, ooh. When the rats have MRIs, do they get headphones? Um, this would really be uh, more along the lines of uh, rehab. And um, after I told my daughter's therapist that I was coming out, they would have said, uh, gee, if you'd have told us a month ago, we would have come too. Uh, so now that I you know, did that, um, I'd like to ask, uh, in going back, obviously sharing my notes, but uh, to say to them, uh, what, as far as um, uh, seminars or anything of that sort, that they could look for in the not-too-distant future, uh, any recommendations that I would make to them? For your therapist, that's what you're asking. So the most important thing you want from your therapist, I think, is someone who's interested in your particular case. So we all have a general degree that's the same, but it's the amount of experience that each one of us has that makes us an expert in one thing or another. So if they're interested in TM and learning about TM, you can provide them with some information. And if they actually will put the effort out to look for it, there's, there are things online. Um, and they can contact me if, any of, if, they're, if it's a PT or OT. But what you really want is someone who has the interest and, has, and will make the time to understand the condition more so that they can spend the time with you when you're in therapy. So you don't really, there aren't, unfortunately, there are not very many continuing education courses. I teach one for MS, for OTs and PTs, but it's in Maryland. So, um, and I, I know the National MS Society has these kind of courses all over the country. I just don't know about your particular area. So that's the other place that could, you could tell them to look in the National MS Society. Their website is actually pretty good. So I would, I would trust what they say about rehab. But, but by all means, trust your gut and, um, and your daughter's. So you should be able to communicate with your therapist and ask any question you think of. And they should be able to address it in some way. Okay. Uh, a lot of the uh, principles of uh, rehabilitation uh, carry over from one diagnosis to the other. So for example, transverse myelitis uh, is a form of spinal cord injury. And there are uh, spinal cord injury centers throughout the country with therapists who are dedicated toward treating traumatic spinal cord injury. And uh, those therapists do keep up with, you know, what's current in the field of uh, spinal cord rehabilitation. So uh, one way to uh, check it out is to see in, in your area of the country, um, is there a um, national center for spinal cord injury rehab? And there are uh, such things, uh, such centers spread out throughout the country. So th that's another resource to uh, check out. I also wanted to just remind everybody that we videotaped this whole symposium and that, the, that these will be available online later this summer and available via, uh, for purchase on DVD. So for your therapists that didn't make it, you can purchase a, a full set of DVDs for them.
Um, so I have one more question for Dr. Kaplan, and it's related to, um, to inflammation, I mean to uh, depression, in the high prevalence of depression in MS and TM. I've understood, and I might be wrong, that IL-6 is partially implicated in that and that inflammation in the brain contributes to depression. And I'm just wondering if the treatments for depression would be different um, than they would be in general because the whole thing about adjusting to this huge massive loss and all of that that goes with it and um, is one, is like, so there's a psychological component, but I'm wondering if the physical component would, would be treated differently because of the inflammation in the brain and the IL-6 that's implicated, if I've understood right. Uh, that, there's a whole lot of subtle points, I think, that you're making there. Um, yes, uh, as I'd sort of shown in that slide, we are testing. We now have a hypothesis that we can either accept or reject um, we're testing the hypothesis that IL-6 not only causes the injury to the spinal cord, but is responsible for the innocent bystander effect on the brain. I'll try to do this very briefly. When we put the uh, IL-6 into the spinal cord, it caused damage. So the next thing we said was, okay, let's put it into the brain and see what it does there. And the graduate students and postdocs thought I was like Mengele or something. They thought, you know, the eyeballs are going to bleed and the animal was going to die, and we waited the two days and three days, at which point the, the, the weakness in the legs was apparent if it was in the spine. A week went by, nothing apparent. You know, two weeks went by, nothing apparent. So the IL-6 was doing something much more subtle in the brain than it was doing in the spinal cord. And, you know, this is what we published, uh, you know, Doug uh, uh, and I published in the JCI in 2005. And when we went, we had to look very carefully, and the one change we did find is that the IL-6 blocked the production of these new neurons. Every antidepressant that's, that's been tried stimulates the production of these new neurons in these regions of the brain. Um, and so we think it is the innocent bystander effect that the IL-6 in low doses actually is probably doing good things, but in high doses blocks the production of new neurons. This calls into the whole perspective the idea that there may be a whole new range of medications that we could potentially develop related to a new pathway uh, as antidepressants. The, the issue that you're talking about, again, goes back, I think, to this idea of reactive depression versus um, endogenous depression, which is this old sort of criteria that has been used. And uh, again, what I would say is reactive depression um, it depends on who you talk to. I think reactive depression, as it was originally defined in my book, is really demoralization. People get sad, it's difficult to adjust, but that's not the clinical, biological kind of depression that we're talking about. So the problem I have is that when you talk about reactive depression, like it's all psychologically mediated, I mean, again, I encourage you to talk to Jim Lubin and Paul and the people here who are fortunate enough to not be in that 50% group that got depressed, and you know what are they reacting to that they're not depressed? So, I mean, the problem is we can all look at our lives at any time when we can find something to point to and say, that's the stress, that's what's making me depressed. But it's the cart and the horse, and all the time when I hear this, I hear you know someone say, well, you know, you'd be depressed too if your wife left you, Doc, and then I ask the wife, why did you leave? Because he was laying on the couch all the time and drinking beer and not you know making love, and he was depressed, so that's why I left. So it's the cart and the horse. I'm not really persuaded that uh, you know none of these medicines are addicting. Uh, they only they're, they're, no one's jonesing out there on the street for Prozac. Uh, they don't lift your mood unless you're depressed. They don't uh, you know have any effect. So, I mean, I think that the important thing is, does the person have a depression? And the reactive versus not reactive is, I think, very much more complicated than it needs to be. I, I will say one last thing, which is that um, what the advanced class that I didn't bring up, which could be a whole other discussion, is that many people here have found what we have found as well, which is there actually tends to be a fairly high rate of what's called either recurrent depression, people who sort of cycle in and out of depressions, or bipolar two, where they'll cycle into a depression and then cycle into an irritable, maybe revved up state. Those are states, those two conditions are very subtle and a psychiatrist should be involved. If you get on an antidepressant and you feel worse, that's a good indication you need to get with a psychiatrist uh, because these conditions, recurrent depression and bipolar II disorder, are very subtle. Uh, they're missed in 80% of the cases uh, by 
even by psychiatrists, unless you take an outside informant, ask a family member, and they're treated very differently. You can't just use an antidepressant. So just because people have been tried on antidepressants, uh, especially if it made them worse or went on steroids, they got very activated and hyper and couldn't sleep. Those are, those are things that we have found predict people to not respond to just antidepressants. They need a more, more uh, sort of cautious approach to the treatment, but still very treatable, just a slightly different treatment. Hope that answered. Uh, Dr. Kaplan mentioned um, Baltimore Sun article. It was written, I think, about a month ago. There was Dr. A Baltimore Kaplan mentioned a Baltimore Sun article written about a month ago about the cytoxin study. So how you would use the word cytoxin to, to uh, find it? Uh, what is a search term to find? I mean, we could just send it to you. We, we, uh, we, we have it in a PDF form, and we could just send you the electronic So we version. look on the website, the Johns Hopkins, or how That's actually we... a good idea. Oh, great. How did you do that that quick? They could go through, it's www.neuro. Um, jhmi.edu, right? Neuro.jhmi? Uh, anyway, just go to jhu.edu. Go to the Hopkins Neurology site, and it's the first story on it. Oh, thank you. Find it. Chitra, could you repeat the website for her? I actually don't. You can always just uh, Google Johns Hopkins transverse myelitis. It'll be the first hit, and when you just click on that link, um, within the Hopkins, that's part of the Hopkins neurology site. Um, in, in Ben's article on TM that was in the journal, you, you quoted uh, that 25% of people with TM at any given time have depression, I think. And I believe you cited in the footnote, it was Adam's uh, article. And if someone challenges that, I'd like to know how big was the sample. I haven't gone and read the citation. In other words, how many, how many people did you test to find that 25% of people with TM had clinical depression? Four, four people. <laughs> and that one person was really depressed. Um, so, <laughs> psychiatry, we don't need very big ends. To, um, so the original work that Chitra had done, it was, I think, 76 patients with transverse myelitis. It was 76 patients with transverse myelitis. Um, we've not published this largely because uh, we've not gotten a good control group. Um, so what we ended up showing in the initial study was patients with MS had very high rates of depression. That has been well studied, well validated. I bury you in uh, studies that have shown this 25% incidence and 50% prevalence of depression in MS. And what we found, what should... Following the diagnosis. So before the diagnosis of MS, same rates as the general population following the diagnosis of MS. No, no, no. Yeah, and cross that. You go into the clinic, you interview people sitting in the chairs in the clinic, one in four depressed with MS. If you take a lifetime uh, survey, two in four or one in two patients will have a clinical depression. Um, Chitra went out and, uh, um, you know, with Doug and uh, surveyed uh, 76 patients with transverse myelitis and found the equivalent rates of depression compared to MS. The problem was that, you know, for a study, what we could say is, gee, it's very high rates, but someone could always say, well, maybe your population of MS patients were just happy, and so it was actually a low rate. So we were trying to get a control population that had lower rates. And that has proved difficulty, difficult for us because we wanted a population of people who had, you know, um, something comparable. For the issue raised uh, by this woman over here, the, many people would say, well, it's just, you know, there's a reactive component. You need people who are going through some kind of similar situation. Um, and so we were trying to get patients who had spinal injury. The only problem with spinal injury is that unlike TM, which will hit men and women equally, Spinal cord injury are young men jumping out of airplanes, and they have a different temperament and the like. So it, it's been difficult to find the right population. And Doug keeps telling me how I'm very slow to get this done. And so thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> Lou, that's a great question. <laughs> I hope he has a 
<laughs> hey, sizes and everything. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd like to know, in patients with uh, transverse myelitis and depression, uh, do you find a higher incidence of depression in people that had their depression start before the transverse myelitis? So it was kind of more... Well, yeah, in, in the people whose depression started before the transverse myelitis, there's 100% prevalence of depression. <laughs> but you mean following the transverse myelitis? Yeah, does it get worse? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And uh, again, don't have the data to back this up because we, that's a retrospective study of trying to do an investigation before you got this. And that's a very valid study. But as Doug appropriately points out, we just need to, the prospective study sort of going forward uh, first. And um, But based on my clinical experience, yeah, a lot of people were, were coping with the depression uh, that they'd had before, and then the wheels came off after the transverse myelitis. It does seem to really be a cause of significant exacerbation. Okay, and then secondary to that, um, in people with treatment-resistant depression, where you know they may have tried all the, all the things in the kit, uh, what about these new, newer, more kind of experimental treatments like vagus nerve stimulation, uh, deep brain stimulation, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, are those shown to be more, uh, you know, have more efficacy than than other types of novel uh, medications, or not? Are they are they worth the risk? Yeah, um, I don't know. The idea popped into my head to mention that some of the conventional things that keep that often get missed are, for instance, I don't know, exercise. <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there's not a perfect pill for everything, but actually, it's interesting. I mean, exercise is great. Um, there have been studies, and uh, Dr. Zakowski, as you call me Dr. Kaplan, um, uh, you know, showed uh, several of these studies that show that it stimulates the growth of neurons that IL-6 has been shown to shut down. and. Uh, sort of sort of makes sense from the biological model we're working with, and that the uh, you know the effects of exercise when done as Dr. Zakowski advocates uh, has been equivalent to Zoloft in some studies um, in terms of the efficacy. And in fact, interestingly, although it was equivalent in how effective it was, it tended to prevent relapse. If you could continue that exercise, it protected you from relapsing because um, antidepressants sometimes, if you have inflammation, then that can sort of overcome the effect of the antidepressant and they can sort of poop out after a while where you need to raise the dose. But exercise was shown in some of these studies, you know, not big enough ends, uh, not reproduce as many times as I'd like, but to suggest that that's very good. The other thing is everybody reaches for the new, the new kid on the block, largely, I think, because the pharmaceutical companies promote them, but some of the tried and true treatments like tricyclics, which do have side effects, and everybody talks about, oh, God, they've got terrible side effects. Um, and it depends on what you mean as a side effect. Um, you know, so the tricyclics do cause dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention, but that constipation, urinary retention may work in your favor and much lower rates of sexual side effects. So, you know, it depends on what you consider a side effect it's, and, and how you define it. I, I love this because my patients always come in and say, you know, I got, doc, that medicine gave me the headache and I just can't deal with it. I said, well, yeah, except you were, you know, thinking about killing yourself stuck in your room for three months and you got to weigh the, you know, effects versus the side effects. And then they'll come in and they'll say, oh, can I get that Orlistat? And Orlistat's that medicine you can take and you see it on television. And, and you know, they're not even quiet about it because it's for weight loss. They know you're going to buy it. So they say, may cause anal seepage. You know, that's okay. I'll take it. Uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a side effect. That's an effect. And, but if it's for weight loss, people will do it, and it's no problem. So, you know, the side effect. And lithium is a medicine for mood instability. It promotes growth of new neurons in the brain as well. It's an old tried and true. They're not promoted. It's a salt. It's not promoted by pharmaceutical companies. So usually the first thing I do is go back and try some of the tried and true before I get to vagal nerve simulators, which don't have nearly the kind of track record and history and data to support their efficacy. But, I mean, it's a valid question, and I would go back and then forward. But, you know, this treatment-resistant name is a bit tough because that's blaming your depression. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's to say your depression's treatment-resistant, and a lot of times it's just that it hasn't been managed right. 
So I don't like that term. <laughs>